We want to welcome all the others joining us out at the campus as a Springs Church. So good to have you with us as we jump into the Word of God. Father, help me to speak today. Let the presence of Jesus touch every mind and every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. As a young 19-year-old man, um, I went to work at Selkirk Hospital and uh, was involved in uh, just working in the back, working uh, with all the different departments and central service and supply, and got involved in a pilot project. There were no paramedics back then in Manitoba, and uh, so the pilot project was being done out of Selkirk General Hospital, and they asked me if I would enroll, and I did, and I began this journey as a young man to see what the streets, the back alleys were like, parties, rapes, murders, child abuse, all the stuff that goes with anybody who works on the front lines of any city today. And it really yanked a lot of the slack off of me. It really began to uninsulate my heart. Christian kids, we tend to get insulated. We live in a great church with a great family, with great parents. And then we have a crisis of faith, and we go check out all the sin that's caused all the problem on the first generation. See, the first generation Christians are the ones who come out of the world, who understand the horrors of sin and what it does. And then you have kids, second generation kids, uh, Christian kids, they just think we've got to go try it all out. Mom and dad were, didn't know what they're talking about. And, uh, and so for me to, to have a look at the hell that went on every night in homes all across the city uh, was an eye-opener to me. Um, Specifically, horrible things that I had seen um, challenged my faith. And I began to read the Word of God as never before. And I did something that I didn't understand that I want to teach on today because I think it's a crucial aspect of the Christian life that's being ignored. What I would do is, uh, after you know, having children die in my arms, after you know, people begging you as you're racing for the hospital, please don't let me die, and then they die, watching people in pain, cancer wards, etc., I began to realize how beautiful the Word of God was. And so each morning, uh, at that point, um, I had be, I moved in with a, a good friend, uh, Dan Johnson, who today is one of the pastors here at the church. If you want to know anything about me uh, in my past, you can talk to him. There are, uh... <laughs> And I would spend each morning, I would get up early, probably about 5.30, and I would get into the Word of God and... I would, especially as I read Mark chapter 16, where it says, these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They will lay hands on the sick. It talked about any deadly thing that would try to take you out couldn't hurt you. You'd speak with new tongues. If you ate any deadly thing, it wouldn't hurt you. And that God confirms his word with signs following. So I would lay on that mahogahide couch and I would read the word, and then I just didn't know how to get past the horrors and the smells and the things that I had seen. And so I would just begin to play and let God's word take me on a dream. And I would begin to dream about anything that Jesus was doing, I saw myself doing. When Jesus walked along the shore, I could just see me walking beside him, my bare feet in the sand. If he was walking up to a funeral, I could just see me walking with him. And Certain verses intrigued me, like Jesus saying in John, the things that I do shall you do also. And so I would see myself touching, hurting people in the presence of God, healing them. I would see myself sh talking with people and tears running down their faces. They made a decision for Christ. I would see myself laying hands on dead bodies and, uh, and people going, <gasps> And coming back to life. I was having a heyday every morning at 5.30. In the midst of all the heartache that I was seeing, I was allowing God's word to impact me. And what I didn't know is that I was being obedient to Romans 12, where it says that we are not to be conformed to this world. You shouldn't form your life, your thinking, your dreams, your visions after the way the world does it, but we should be transformed. 
There is a new way of living. There's a new kingdom to live within. Didn't even understand at the time. I was just doing this because I was hurting. You know, a lot of people quit jobs where they have to deal with hurting, crying, dying people every day. It's not for everyone. And so I had that struggle. And as I begin to read God's word, and it was no longer Jesus did this and Paul did that, it was Leon was doing this. Leon could do that. And it just ignited my imagination every morning. And I found that it gave me such strength. It gave me such ability to get in the word and just see me in the word. Something happened shortly after. I tell the story and in the book, The Spirit Contemporary Life, where I really share all the concepts that God began to deal with me as a young man. And I begin to believe for the first time. And I remember touching that first baby. Uh, they asked me as to, to just watch it in the pediatric ward. It was getting ready to go in for surgery. It was a newborn baby. And, and it was just crying and crying and crying and crying because there was something wrong with the stomach. Stew food wouldn't go through. And I remember just getting kind of annoyed by the crying and uh, just reaching over and just touching it on the stomach and just speaking life to it. And the baby just stopped crying. Well, that's kind of cool. Maybe he just went to sleep. And uh, so I'm waiting for the nurse to come back from coffee break. And uh, I'm looking, I'm kind of standing at the door looking down the hall. And the nurse is walking down. All of a sudden, about mm, 50 feet down the hall, she starts to run. I'm looking at her going, What? And she's running. She runs into the room. She's gasping. She goes, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I go, what's wrong? She goes, that baby hasn't stopped crying since it was born. She goes, why is it not crying? I said, it's just sleeping over here. And she walked over there with her eyes amazed because here's a baby just sleeping comfortably. And didn't tell her anything because I was as shocked as she was that I just pray a simple prayer and the presence of God. And as I followed up the situation, uh, when they went in and examined this child, it didn't need an, an operation anymore. And it just went home with mom. And it began a journey in my life of, amen, thank you, Lord. It began a journey in my life of renewing my mind, but then an area that I had never been taught on was to renew my imagination. Imagination is a word that the religious church hates. They'll cross their arms and wave their hands at you. You're just being new age. You're just being mind over matter. This is Christian science. This is not the gospel. And oh, the, the, the attack I get when I use the word imagination. So I think they must think that God... Just goes, oh, I created something and it got an imagination. What's an imagination? I didn't even have a purpose for imagination. I don't know why my creation has an imagination. Are you kidding me? God knows exactly why. He created your mind, your memory, and your imagination. And so therein lied the story of my life began... I began to first pray for the sick, and I began to see miracle after miracle as God began to heal people and testimony after testimony. And in the book, The Spirit Contemporary Life, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to get it because it's a modern-day look at miracles in hospitals, miracles in ambulances, miracles in front of doctors, miracles in front of OR, on the OR teams. And, and then as I began to grow, God brought me here to Springs Church. And Springs Church was a mess when we were here. It was called Springs of Living Water Center. It was pretty much bankrupt. Uh, they couldn't even afford to pay me as much as a church of 100 was paying me as their youth, youth pastor. Uh, you know, the staff used to race to the bank to see whose check would cash first because wouldn't, they wouldn't all cash. Um, and I remember coming in here, and now there's a different thing that I have to apply my faith to. At first, it was miracles of healing. And now, uh, we begin to realize, whoa, this, is, this, this place is in bad straits. We've got to figure out a way to get the giving up. And I remember, uh, you know, seeing people, and from the first service, people began to give their lives to Christ, getting saved, and the church began to grow. And I, in my office, people would line up to see me for counseling, and I finally talked to the board and said, I want my own bathroom. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I want you to build a bathroom off my office. So well, what for? I said, because when I go to the bathroom, people are walking into the bathroom because they get a chance to get me for counseling. And they would talk to me through the door. They would stand beside me at the urinal. And I said, I just, I need my own bathroom. So they agreed. And we <laughs> built seven, you know, over in St. Mary's and I got my own bathroom. And so I could get my work done without, you know, it just, the church was growing. People were hungry. God was doing things. And I would go into the sanctuary and tell them not to bother me. And I would 
go out to the piano, and uh, a lot of people don't know that I play piano, trumpet, guitar, bass. I just spent years of leading worship and praise for my dad, and I would just sit at the piano, and I would just worship God. And I just thank him that from the north, the south, the east, and the west, the people would begin to gather. I begin to pray that they would line up at the doors on 479 St. Mary's Road, that we wouldn't be able to park the cars, that people would begin to come. And down one aisle, I would see people giving their lives to Christ. And down the other aisle, waving crutches and saying, I'm healed, I'm healed. My imagination would just go wild as I would just spend time in prayer in the sanctuary of that little place over in 479 St. Mary's. And what I didn't realize was at the time, was that I was just doing this because I was enjoying spending time with God so much. I was seeing him doing incredible things. And it wasn't but a little while later, they lined up at the doors. We moved the kids a good mile away. You had to drop your kids off at the school and then come to church. And then when you're done church, go back and pick up your kids. And we were parking on five parking lots and down the streets. And people were lining up. We'd get them saved and say, now leave. Go to your car. Take your car. Don't hang around. We need your seat. We need your parking spot. we got two more services. God was doing incredible things. Things. And the thing that, that changed my life the most was this area of do not be conformed to this world because you have been designed to do amazing things. You're designed as a creature of faith. The, the measure of faith that God has given every born-again believer in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 is the measure that you have. Nobody has a greater access to God than anybody else. Nobody has greater grace. Nobody has greater faith. And so I, the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, the imagination's a part of your mind. And if you're not going to renew it, it is going to destroy your life. Over and over in the Bible, it talks about vain imaginations. It talks about Noah when he makes his first sacrifice after the flood. And God was talking about how that the imagination of their heart is evil always. We talk about the Tower of Babel and Nimrod and how that God had to separate the languages because anything they could imagine, they would be able to do. This imagination is all through the Word of God. But Christians today, they want to just back off. I mean, most, most uh, places I go where I speak and I work with denominational heads, general overseers, they'll tell me these denominations are dying. These churches are going down. We're selling campuses. We're trying to fill up our seminaries, our Bible schools, because there's just not a spirit. That, and I share with them spirit contemporary. We need the Holy Spirit as never before, but we need to function in a contemporary and a relevant way. And so they're hungry to know how does God's word work. And so I began to recognize as a young man that my imagination was something God gave me. But I would look through the Bible for the word imagination, and I couldn't find it that often. I found more negative words about the word imagination. And then I recognized there were other words that were used instead of imagination. Do you know what the main one is in the Greek? It's the word hope. What is hope? Hope is future tense. You don't hope for what you've got. If you've got a car, don't tell me you're hoping for one. You got one. You say, I have a wife. You're not hoping for a wife. You have one. And so hope is for what you do not have. And so hope is future tense. Well, the imagination gives you the ability to create in your own heart and mind your future. Your memory is your ability to remember your past. All five senses are your ability to enjoy your present. A lot of people don't even do that. And so I begin to recognize that to dream, to envision the future was something that the Word of God would do to me. And it's something that we must understand as Christians, that to read the Word, that this Word will tell you who you are, what you can do, where you can go, what is the very purpose of our lives, what has God done at the cross. And as you begin to get involved in the Word, the Word paints new pictures. Now, where does it paint new pictures? Not in your memory, because your memory remembers old pictures. You begin to hope. You begin to look to the future. People who have active imaginations but have never disciplined themselves in the word are just crazy dreamers. But the language of the heart is dreams and visions. 
The Bible says your young men will dream dreams, your old men will have visions. And it's talking about when the Holy Spirit is poured out. So the Spirit of God in your life, as you discipline yourself to learn the Word of God, the Word of God begins to paint pictures. And the Bible teaches us, we do not look at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are not seen. That word seeing is the word for senses, the five senses. It is saying that we should not be looking at what we have because the five senses are in the now. They'll tell you what you're smelling now, hearing now, seeing now, touching now, uh, feeling now. It's, it's the, all five senses are in the now. Memories in the past, imagination is in the future. But do you think the church will even talk about the word imagination? No. We'll use obscure terms like seeing with the eyes of faith or I'm not moved by what I see but what I believe. But if you really want to get down to it, hope is to begin to allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to paint beautiful pictures. Sitting at that piano or walking around that, that little auditorium that seated about 300 people before we renovated it, I begin to just see it packed out and packed out. As I begin to walk, I'm a pastor, and so that's what God has called me to. So what we had going on was great. It was growing. Things were happening. I just began to believe that we'd see it packed out over and over again. And then we begin to say, well, now we've got it packed out. We've got the kids gone. Now what are we going to do? We're using parking lots. We're parking down streets. We're getting complaints. And I thought, well, I'm believing one day the police will have to do the traffic at Springs Church. I'm just believing that we're going to have a campus. We're going to fill that thing up. And I just begin to pray, and I begin to see it on the inside. I can see that police car, lights going on, and police directing in the streams of people coming down our freeways. And for anyone that has been here, you'll know a great period of the life of Springs Church. Without our lights, we'd have police on the highways. And we'd go all the way back across number one. People would be coming in on services trying to get in. And I began to see the very things that I was dreaming about years before begin to happen and I begin to recognize this is a very crucial key and I begin to on purpose go okay I've been doing something how do I explain this well what I'm doing is taking God's Word reading it speaking it but a lot of people speak it but they don't do the last step which is to see what you speak okay now spoken words override every emotion that you have. If you can't control your emotions, let's say you're filled with fear right now about a situation in your life, and you just, you're trying to get rid of the fear. The only way you will find to successfully get rid of a present emotion is to speak the opposite, to take God's word and to speak it. And you will find that spoken words override emotions. And so that is why the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. I, I would find certain verses that I had never understood before, like this one. Mark 10, 15 says, Verily I say unto you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child won't enter it. Now, the kingdom of God is not heaven. The kingdom of God is not salvation. He didn't say, he, he, see, he didn't say, Verily I say unto you, whoever shall not receive the gift of salvation. He's not talking about the gift of salvation here. He's talking about entering the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is one of the kingdoms on this planet. There's only two. We might have hundreds of countries, but we only have two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God is called the kingdom of God. It's also referred to as the kingdom of heaven. There's a little bit of difference, but in, in it's meaning that we function under a different set of rules on a world where the kingdom of darkness is here. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says Satan's the god of this world. But in this world, we have the right and the inheritance and the privilege and what Jesus has done is given us ability pre-heaven before we get to heaven to walk in the principles that heaven has. That's why his will be done on earth as it is in heaven heaven. And so to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to be as a little child. But what has a little child got? You don't have imagination. We know that kindergarten, these kids are so imaginative, you, you got to stop them from daydreaming. Then about three or four, grade three or four, tests have proven it. We find the imagination begins to just totally distill down. And every year of your life, you become more focused on the memories of your skills. You become more focused on what you can do than what maybe you can do. 
And as you get older, you will find that this ability to imagine that you could do new things, bigger things, different things, better things, begins to fade away as you attempt stuff and you get embarrassed, you get hurt. Uh, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, meaning you try for new things. Put the word imagination in there. You begin to dream and imagine a new life and it fails and the job goes down, bankruptcy and failed marriages and loss of loved ones begins to hit away at you until this hope, this imagination gets deferred and it makes your heart sick. Well, your heart is what you believe with. You can't doubt in your heart. You've got to believe in your heart. And so faith becomes something we stop living by. And then we start criticizing the young because, yeah, I remember when I used to think that way. You know, don't go shutting down young Christians. Don't go shutting down teenagers because I'm going to go, I'm going to be doing this because the imagination is the word hope. So now abide these three, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. Faith is crucial. Love is crucial. And this hope, it, it, it's close. It, it is very similar to this word, imagination. Dream again. Believe again. See things ahead of you again. And when you pray, you should be sitting back in a chair in your devotion time, and you should be dreaming about what you could see. I dreamed that I could lay hands on the sick, and that wherever I would go, that they would recover. And then when I got responsible for money, I began to dream that they'd, people begin to pack out. Then I realized I got to pay bills, that everything we do is millions of dollars. Well, I was raised in a home where my dad shot moose to feed us because we couldn't always afford beef. I mean, if we wanted the dishwasher because us boys did dishes, we had to pray for it. We learned to believe. And I began to recognize that believing works on finances too. And that faith is the substance of things. Hope is imagination. So similar. It is a future tense ability to see something that is not present in your life. And to focus like laser beams. They just lock on. You know, I watch these movies of jets flying through the sky. And, and, and they're, they're dog fighting. They're trying to, and all of a sudden, brrr, lock on. And the, this guy's finished now. Laser, you know, the missile gun, bam, gone. The church of Jesus Christ has never learned to lock on with hope and imagination. And this is my dream. I know the bank says this. I know I don't have that money. I know this is going on. But I'm locked on and believing God. And then you begin to live like a child would. You begin to live from something called faith. A measure of faith that has been delivered to every Christian upon being born again. The God kind of faith. A measure of the faith Jesus used has been given to you. What are you doing with this? Or are you going to live your life just the way it's always been? So if you're going to live by faith, then you are looking at something that is not seen or sensed. You are dreaming about something that has not happened. And the word faith and it is something that a lot of people have backed away because they've all tried it and they all know somebody it didn't work for. And this is the line I hear all the time. I had faith and it didn't work, so I'm struggling with this. No such thing. You had maybe hope. Maybe you had something like a mental ascent. But the word faith is not about worldly hope. The word faith is about a supernatural faith that it's a done deal. And when faith rises in the heart of a believer, this is the victory that overcomes the world. And it doesn't say maybe. It says even our faith. When it talks about the great men and women of old, it talks about by faith they subdued kingdoms. By faith they took out cities. By faith they raised up great countries. By faith they shut the mouths of lions. By faith they raised up their dead. By faith they died, refusing to stay. Go, I'm going home. This faith that has been offered and given to you and I is something that I am not giving up. I have discovered that it works. And so all these experts who have sat me down from television to whatever conferences I'm at and tell me that doesn't work, I'm going, well, I got a list of about 100 miracles just in physical stuff. I got a list of miracles on financial stuff. God's doing stuff from organization to organization. What about 13 languages around the world that we weren't doing before? Don't tell me faith doesn't work. Faith, the substance of things hoped for or imagined, and the evidence of things not seen or sensed with your five senses Yet, what are you doing with the Word? The reason the Word will transform your life is because as you read the Word, it should engage 
your imagination. This imagination is literally the place where the word is conceived. It comes down into your heart and the word is seen, felt, imagined. And you lock onto that with laser-like focus and you begin to read his word. The, th the reason I love the word so much is because the word tells me who I am. What's been paid for me? That I have an inheritance. That I can be like Jesus. That grace is a gift. That righteousness is a gift. So all the areas the enemy attacks me in are easily defeated when I realize it's not about my good behavior. It's about Jesus' good behavior. Now, thank God, because he gave me his grace, I can live with his power in a godly manner. It's not an excuse to sin. But my challenge to you is today, change your imagination. Use your imagination. Come on, Grandpa. It's not, you know, your bones might be a little stiff, but your imagination shouldn't be stiff. Caleb was 80 years old, but just said, give me the mountain. Why? Because I've been watching that mountain for 40 years. You couldn't see it. You were in the desert. I was seeing it in here. That's my mountain. Moses promised me my mountain. I've been imagining my mountain for 40 years. Now, give me my mountain. He went in and took his mountain. This imagination, what are you doing with it? Change it, because if you don't change it, it's going to kill you. Your imagination? Yeah, because it works either way. Fearful people are imagining a bad report. Fearful people can see their own funeral. Fearful people even have their pallbearers picked. Fearful people can see their house being possessed. Fearful people can see their business going bankrupt. Fearful people watch the news, and it adds to their fears. And so all these vain imaginations, all these negative imaginations, fill their lives, fill their hearts. We have such active imaginations in the negative that 90% of all the drugs for depression and for stress are all in Canada and America. Why is that? Because we listen to the news, and it's, oh, it's the coronavirus, and, and oh, it's pig flu last year, and swine flu the year before, and A13191711, or whatever new thing they're going to name. And, you know, and so we as Christians should just lay down to this thing and just go, oh, you know, our, our life is so hard. A thousand will fall at my side, and 10,000 at my right hand, but it's not coming near me. That's my confession. You know, if you're going to embrace Christianity, which is already a pretty crazy religion because Jesus has a father without a mother and he died on a cross. We don't know where he went, but we believe he died for our sins and he went to hell in our place. Prove any of that. You believe it. You may as well believe the rest. I mean, if you can believe the salvation bit, the rest is easier. So let's just get all in and go, the word says, the word says, the word says. And let's renew our minds, believe God for the future, and go do great exploits. Amen? <laughs> Praise your Lord. Father, I pray today that every one of us will be touched by this incredible ability that you've given us. As born-again believers, you have delivered to us this measure of faith. It moves mountains, it solves problems, it heals bodies, it creates countries. Father, it takes over countries, it subdues lions' mouths and problems. And so, Father, we live by faith. We declare your word by faith. And we're not giving in and conforming to this pathetic status quo of the world. Father, touch everyone in this room. Let from the oldest grandpa and grandma, let them ignite this imagination and dream again. And begin to believe you for things they haven't seen. Father, whether it's unsaved grandkids or finances, Father, let us not be moved by what we see. Let us be moved by what we believe. Father, let the dreamers rise up. Let the imagination be stirred by the very presence of God. And Holy Spirit, your job is to stir up our imaginations and show us things we do not know and to take us into places we've never seen before. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, God. And thank you for creating within every one of us an imagination. We choose to use ours. And we renew it with your word. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody in agreement said, amen. amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Give Jesus a hand. Come on, amen. <laughs> Woohoo!